SAS is the Special Forces Regiment upon which all others are based. Few are tough enough to pass selection. But what does it take to survive once you make it into the Special Air Service? Using a series of dramatic scenarios, a team of hardened ex-SAS veterans have agreed to reveal the survival secrets that kept them alive. The commander of our four-man patrol is former SAS Sergeant Eddie Stone. With him is demolitions expert John McAleese, the first man on the balcony in the Iranian embassy siege. Additional firepower and expertise is provided by Johnny and Pete. We've had to protect their identities. Together, they'll show you how members of the world's most elite regiment fight and survive, and reveal just what it takes to wear this badge. On SAS Survival Secrets, we reveal how to survive brutal interrogation and torture Name, rank and number. when in the hands of a violent enemy force. And we look at how to escape and invade the enemy SAS style. Last time on SAS Survival Secrets, a four-man patrol went on a fictitious mission behind enemy lines. They set up an observation post, gathered intelligence, and took out a target. But this has led them to being compromised, and resulted in a series of running battles with the enemy ever since. Then things went from bad to worse, as one of the patrol was killed, and another critically injured. In order to stand a better chance of making it back to their extraction point, Eddie, as patrol commander, took the difficult decision of leaving injured patrolman Mac behind. An elite hunter force is tracking the SAS team and has already located and captured Mac. But will they catch the other two? two remaining members of the SAS patrol. Unaware of Mac's capture, they have made good tracks overnight and are nearing a helicopter rendezvous ready for extraction. The RVs are pickup points, are pre-selected prior to the mission. We'll look at the map, we'll choose them off the map, areas of little habitation, areas where the aircraft or the boat can get into. We'll pick three or four different locations. If we get bumped at one, we can always resort to the secondary RV. When you arrive at the RV, then you will contact your pickup. A determined hunter force remains hard on the heels of the two-man patrol. But because they need to make a quick getaway, the team has abandoned the normal operating procedure of covering their tracks. This has allowed the commanders of the hunter force to use their expert tracking skills to pursue them. Yes, very fresh. No more than 10, 15 minutes. The SAS know this will happen, but they have no choice. They are outnumbered, so their only option is to get to their extraction position as quickly as possible. Just keep cover, I'm just going to go on the side there. Hold Having had to destroy their radio when making their escape, Eddie prepares to call in a rescue helicopter using his Sabi. Sabi has been used by the SAS since the mid-1950s and is a lightweight radio allowing ground patrols to link up with support aircraft flying overhead. Hotel 1, Hotel 1, this is Charlie 19, ready for pickup, ready for pickup, over. Hotel 1, Hotel 1, Roger, EDA, your location, five minutes. As the SAS patrol wait to be extracted, the elite hunter force prepare to surround and capture them. Five minutes, mate. The Hunter Force are highly aware of the combat skills of the patrol and know that the only way to capture them is by surprise and overwhelming numbers. Their commander plans to synchronize the movement of his men into position quickly and quietly, knowing that one wrong movement or slight noise could alert the SAS. <laughs> Outnumbered and outgunned, the patrol have no other options but to give themselves up. When you're initially captured or challenged by the enemy, 
troops, the first thing you've got to do is look at the enemy. See if they're professional. See how many of them are. See if you're surrounded. If you're surrounded, then you won't commit suicide, you'll try and fight your way out of it. If you don't, a sensible person will surrender. Then look for the earliest opportunity to reverse that situation. Now at the mercy of their enemy, all Eddie and Pete have to look forward to is a violent interrogation process. For frontline troops, taking prisoners requires precious manpower and resources. But to the intelligence specialist, the prisoner is a crucial asset. He may have information about troop strengths and positions that could make the difference between a battle won or lost. As a captive, you're likely to be taken to the nearest enemy post that has secure holding facilities. Here you can expect nothing but rough justice from enemy troops. This is just the start of the softening up process. They'll want to humiliate and degrade you and try to destroy your spirit and resolve. Only a brief respite, it's time for your interrogation ordeal to begin. The first stages you're likely to encounter are known as TQ. TQ, or tactical questioning, is the initial brutal interrogation phase. A local commander will attempt to extract information from you. At the same time, he's making a decision on whether or not you're a candidate for further questioning by interrogation experts at a more secure facility. Try and be the grey man, not too aggressive and not too submissive. Under the Geneva Convention, I only have to give this guy four details. Number, rank, name, date of birth. But what you've got to do is keep your mind alert, say the big four, appear submissive, not too submissive, and not too aggressive, grey man. Let him think he's on top of you, but he's not because mentally you're still very, very alert. Name, rank, look up Edward, Edward look up Edward, name, rank and number Edward. Name, rank and number! Stone, two four, double nine eight, six, Zero nine. What's your unit, Edward? <coughs> you need to try to play the sympathy card with your captors. Always exaggerate your injuries. You're trying to look fatigued, in pain, and weak. Do you like some water, Edward? Always take any chance to eat or drink when it's right in front of you. You're not being submissive. You're just trying to survive. Put it back in the table. Is that nice, Edward? You want another drink, Edward? Edward, all you have to say is yes. Even saying a simple yes could have far-reaching consequences. If you answer yes to a question, you can get edited in on a tape recorder and it can be, do you like Saddam Hussein? fill the yes in. Do you like Tony Blair? To fill the no in. So at all times you only answer your big four, number, rank, name, date of birth. Cigarette Edward, simply answer yes. It's yours. This is not normal British Army issue, is it, Edward? Only special forces use this. You special forces, Edward? 
nothing to spy into. What did Chris Postle add with? Sing here, I'll give it to you. Like you, I'm a military man. I'm trying to make things easy. Simply sign the paper, Edward, and you can have it. It goes without saying that under no circumstances should you sign anything. Once they've got your signature, it could be used for all kinds of propaganda. Pay attention. It's been very difficult, Edward. Perhaps we should try another method. Do you want to be dead, Stone? <coughs> Never underestimate your importance as a new captive. If they wanted you dead, you probably already would be. The chances are that they are under strict orders to keep you alive until a professional interrogation can begin. Until then, they will take it in turns to interrogate you and your fellow captives, playing one against the other in a constant barrage of questioning and abuse. Show me on the map where the target was. Do you want to drink, Peter? Yes or no, do you want to drink, Peter? What's this for, Peter? Guards! Between interrogation sessions, you will probably undergo unrelenting softening up techniques day and night. You'll be deprived of food, water, and sleep. They'll use sudden shocks, constant loud white noise, anything that will disorientate your mind, weaken your resolve, and deprive you of your senses. Worst of all is the dreaded stress position. The technique of using stress positions is simple, but highly effective in softening up captives. When forced to remain in these positions, your muscles soon start to seize up. It becomes agony after an hour and torturous after several. But eventually you get used to it and you can't sleep as I have done in these positions. You have to. It's the only way you survive. the general's location, Stone. <coughs> Write down the name Stone and you'll be free. They'll stop beating you, Stone. I think you're SAS, Stone. I think you've been sent here to assassinate... 24-09-6998. Unit? Stone. Unit Stone. <coughs> How did you insert Stone? Helicopter? <coughs> Parachute. Did any locals help you, Stone? Are you married, Stone? <coughs> Do you want your wife to be a widow, Stone? Guards! These initial interrogations are often no more than crude, brutal beatings with no real game plan. You're merely being softened up for the next stage at enemy headquarters where professional interrogators will have already been briefed on your capture and be preparing their insidious tactics. Once you are in the stronghold of headquarters, escape will be much tougher. This may be the last you see of daylight for a long time. Once inside, the opportunity to escape will be extremely limited. This hell pit could be your new home for days, weeks or months and the enemy will be doing everything in their power to make life as uncomfortable as possible for you. This will include the continued use of softening up tactics. By now you'll be desperate for food, water and sleep. While your captors soften you up, interrogation officers will be doing their research to find out how to make you crack. They'll be gathering as much intelligence as possible from initial searches of your clothing, overheard conversations, and any 
other information they can gather. They're building up a picture of you. Are you weak or strong? Can you take punishment? What gets to you? Are you cool or emotional? This will be used for the next stage of your ordeal, when a professional interrogator takes over. Our professional interrogator for this fictitious scenario is Paul Ashley, a former armed forces instructor on resistance to interrogation techniques. The interrogation environment will have been designed purposely to be bland and featureless. They want to deprive you of any distractions that will take your mind off the situation. The interrogator will be constantly analyzing your responses and deciding on the best approach to weaken you. He's looking for that chink in your armor that reveals your weakest point. He may decide to be nice and accommodating, or he may be vindictive and use threats. He'll try every approach he knows until he thinks you're cracking. A lot of people have got this imagination that thinks they're going to be tortured all the time. That is not the case. Even if you control the physical, you don't control the man. If you control his mind, then you have it. Okay, listen to me. What I want you to do is to take your hood off. Hand it to me. Pick it up. Pick it up. I asked you to hand it to me. It's not a very good start, is it? Look at me. Look at me. Look at me here. Eye contact is absolutely crucial for an interrogator because what you're trying to do is to get him to concentrate on you. The eyes are the windows to the soul. It's a very true statement. The eyes will move in various locations on the reaction to various questions that are put to them. There are six areas. One, two, three, four, five, six. If you want to recall something, a past event or something of that nature, then the majority of people will move up into the top right. If they're making things up, it'll come from the top left. If you touch a raw nerve, then the eyes will move down to the left or to the bottom right. The way in which you can get round this is to train yourself to keep looking straight ahead as soon as a question is asked to you. Because otherwise, at one point, you're going to trip up and your eyes will move to one location or the other. Now, what's your name? What's your name? Stone. Yeah, stone what? At this time, I look for any abnormalities with the interrogator. Has he got a big nose? What's your number? Is he very tall? Has he got big eyes? Is there something wrong with him? And I play mental games with myself. I downgrade the guy mentally to allow me a little bit of pleasure. But at the same time, maintaining this exterior presence of the grey man, not aggressive and not submissive. Okay, what I want you to do is to take your jacket off. Curtis here, and I'd appreciate it if you do exactly the same thing. So hand me the jacket. There's no point fighting the thing, is there? One way or the other, I get the jacket. So what I'm asking you to do is to place it in my hand. Well done. Control is everything here. The interrogator has to maintain authority and command. He'll use humiliating tactics to degrade you, such as making you strip off and get into ill-fitting prisoner clothing while he rifles through your kit.
important thing Nein. is to still keep control in your mind. Let him think that he's winning. And if you get away with it, use silent forms of defiance. Any little bit of defiance that you can get in at this stage is going to be worthwhile to you mentally. But if you get caught, you're going to get a good beating. The professional interrogator has a motive or agenda for every word he speaks and every action he makes. You recognize this? Is this yours? At his disposal will be an arsenal of mind games designed to outwit even the most experienced soldier. Right, if that's not yours, you keep it. If it is yours, hand it to me. You're in a no-win situation here. Whatever you do, you're giving him an answer. This is a typical example of some of the many ploys and tricks an interrogator will use to trip you up. Interrogation can have different approaches, such as the good cop and the bad cop routine, known as the Mutt and Jeff. The idea being that one is friendly and the other one is very, very aggressive. Give me a call sign. A call sign I can stop all this and get some good... Call sign, loser! Call sign! Even members of the opposite sex can be used. This way you can get a different reaction from the prisoner. Would you like me to treat your cuts and bruises? If you look carefully, you can see Eddie's eyes moving slightly different to what they do when he's talking or looking at me. You look a lot better now than the last time I saw you. How are you feeling? Eh? Feeling a lot better now? Haven't had your face dressed by a pretty girl. Would you like a cigarette? If you want a cigarette, take it. Do you mind if I have a cigarette? Okay, so you're quite happy now because you've got a cigarette and you've been, you've been looked after. What about the other members of your patrol? How many people were there on the patrol? so we can look after them the way we've looked after you. There's a guy that's helped us out by the name of Peter. His name in the belt. <coughs> He's told us some of the information that we require, but not everything. And what I'd like you to do is to confirm it. Likewise, I'd like to find out who the guy was that was killed. Can you help us out with that one? So you're not interested in your own men? So look at me. Look at me. Guards! Why did I faint? Not because I was feeling faint. Shut him up. Pure and simply to get out of the interrogation room. If he feels sympathy for you, you can get taken out and hopefully you'll get a bit of rest. It doesn't always work, but it's worth a chance. Fainting is a thing that can be used to get out of an interrogation. However, in a lot of places, all he would get is severe kicking and beating until he got up. Interrogators will always use fellow captives against each other. But those with injuries can be particularly weak and vulnerable. One of the members of Eddie's squad, Mac, who had been seriously wounded and left to fend for himself, has been found, treated, and is now fit enough to be interrogated and possibly exploited. Okay, I'm going to take your blindfold off. Look at me. How are you feeling? Look at me. If you're okay, blink your eyes. Well done. Want some food? Want some food? Look at me, Stone. Look at me. Okay, this chap here is cooperating with us. He's been looked after medically. He's also got some food and he's got some drink. So if you cooperate, you get food, you get drink. Put your blindfold on. I, at this stage, am glad to see Mike. 
He's been better treated. Guards, take it back to his cell. He's been hospitalised, and he's not looking too bad. I know Mike hasn't cooperated. I know he's doing exactly the same as I would do. Get the food and get it down your neck, and keep your mouth shut. When you're under stress or lying, your subconscious mind can easily betray you. The slightest raise of an eyebrow or twitch of the nose can be an indication that you're covering something up. Every time I see you, I find out something different. Every time you come in here, there's something about you that comes across. So by thinking and sitting there saying nothing is wrong. Body language is a very important tool for an interrogator because with it, he can ask you questions that you will react to in different manners. The eyes might screw up if you're asking him a very sensitive thing or something he's not terribly happy with, or the fists might start to clench, in which case you know that the questions that you're putting to the captive is having some reaction and you can use against him over and over again. You were caught using this piece of equipment. So who were you calling? What was your call sign? Show me where you were caught and where you were going to. Would you like some food and drink? At some stage, you're going to need food and water to keep going. Because without those, you're going to be nothing. You'll die. But do you want to live? There comes a stage where the softly, softly tactics may fail and the interrogator will resort to threats and abuse. Look at me! Look at me! What was your call sign? No point standing there looking like that. All I want to know is your call sign. I'm asking you what was the call sign. You stupid man, I was. You put yourself all through this rubbish. You'll start a relentless routine of verbal and physical attacks, threatening your life and the lives of your comrades. You are the one that's going to tell me this is where your willpower you and strength will be tested to the extreme. Look at me. You're not doing yourself any favours. If they're going to kill you, they would have killed you a long time ago. They still think you've got information. Verbal abuse and physical abuse, then you get used to it after a period of time. The pain, you know you're going to get a kick in, you just accept it and get on with it. After a certain time, you will have achieved your goal by holding out long enough to allow command to realise you are missing and the mission has been compromised. They can then take the appropriate action. You've won, and it's time to think about protecting yourself and your men. When he gets the pliers out and starts snapping your fingers, you're going to start telling him something. Feed him little snippets of information. It doesn't have to be the truth, as long as it's a half-truth. Gives him something to work on. Gradually, over a few days, he will get the picture and he will start fitting things together. That will keep him happy and keep all your fingers intact. For quite a while now to think about other things, haven't you? All the time, your friend has been deteriorating very, very badly. So in order for you to, to save his life, you've now got to start cooperating. Do you understand me? I don't know anything, mate, honestly. Was that guy, Johnny, I think he, no. What was his name? I think it was Johnny. I mean, I didn't even know his, what his old name was. He was just telling me what he did. You were caught using this. I took it off his body. Hotel One, Hotel One, this is Charlie One Nine. Ready for pickup, ready for pickup, over. What was your call sign? Bravo One Nine. <laughs> So if you were using it trying to get hold of somebody, you must have known on the map roughly where you were. Could it have been this beach here? I really don't know. Was that where your extraction point? I don't know, man. When I was kept in the dark and all the things, I think they trusted me, you know, because, uh, you know, I was strange into the, with these people. A drink. I can organise that for you. I'm still curious to know which beach you're at. I really don't know. I need a little bit more than what you've given me now so I can get some treatment to your man. <clears throat> I really don't know. We landed in the boat. I don't have a clue where it was. What time did you come in? 
just after the evening, I think it was. Yeah, I was Had you been in the boat during daylight? Ah, we, well, we were in the boat all the time. I need a drink, mate. What about Mac's role? Mac? You? Mac. I really don't what know. What was his job? I don't know. I was just saying, I just came in and I never met many of them. They never even spoke to me most of the time. All I've got is bodies everywhere. From you and your team. Doesn't mean my answer. I'm telling you the truth, man. I know that you're lying to me. I can't tell you what I know, I mean, I really don't know a lot. You aren't lying to me. Okay. You're the man that pulled the trigger that assassinated one of our top ranking officers. I can hardly shoot a gun, mate. No, I've really shot a gun. You person. had trouble shooting a gun? I don't know what you're saying. I'm getting more confused. How can you be confused when you were the team leader? I wasn't the team leader. You were the team leader. You were the sergeant in charge of the patrol. Now bearing in mind, your colleague's life is depending on you. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. I'm, I'm, I'm just... I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I'm lucky. That's the way life is until you start to cooperate with us. I'm telling you the truth. That's all I know. Look at me. I'll tell you what I want from you. I want to know how you gained the information that made that assassination. Do we understand one another? Do we understand one another? I understand. A simple yes or no? I understand you fine, but... Uh, right. I can't even... Stand up. I, I, I'll try and help. Stand up. I, I don't know how, yes. Now the interrogator's got a sniff of the truth, he'll continue his routine for as long as it takes until he's satisfied he's got all the facts. Get these guys to stop giving that kicking. We'll start cooperating. Guards! The most important thing is that you've done your job. You've got through the ordeal without compromising your command, and you're still alive. Which means there's always a chance you may be rescued, or you may get the opportunity to break out. But without doubt, the best time to escape would have been as soon as possible after capture. So, what if circumstances had been different and our team were able to escape? Let's rerun the action at the moment of capture with a few small changes to swing the odds. We're back at the beach where Eddie has radioed the helicopter to make the pickup. Hotel one, hotel one, this is Charlie one nine. Hold your copy over. This time, it's the local militia, not professional soldiers who are after them. Pete, instead of keeping sentry, has decided to break out the rations. This is strictly against SOP, standard operational procedure. But don't forget, it's been a long, hard mission. Besides, it's the only way that this lot would ever get the drop on the SAS. The local militia may have got there first, but the elite troops are not far behind. So Eddie and Pete, although unarmed, will have to act soon. When captured by the enemy, your best chance of escape is during the first few minutes. But escape is only the beginning of the story. Ahead of them, there's a long, hard slog cross-country, hunted by an elite enemy force. The further a prisoner of war is moved from the point of capture, the less chance they have of successfully escaping. Over the Second World War, 130 Allied servicemen tried to break out of the notorious Kolditz Castle. Less than a quarter ever got clean away from the prison. In an age of global positioning and heat imaging, the places where an escapee can hide are fast running out. Escape is best tried sooner rather than later. Or better still, don't get caught at all. For an SAS soldier caught behind enemy lines, the chances are he'll be dead before he ever gets to a POW camp. Hey, stop! Turn For them, anything is better than being taken prisoner. Taking a weapon from someone is extremely dangerous, even for a highly skilled soldier. This is most definitely a last resort combat survival technique for the SAS only. This arm of mine is relatively simple, but first of all, you've got to have the balls to do it. The 
first thing you do is deflect the weapon away from your body. You then withdraw the weapon from him. You've got control of the weapon. With a rifle is exactly the same as with a pistol. You've got to move the rifle away from the danger area of your body. Grab it, knock him down, take control of the weapon. But in our scenario, they have only a fraction of a second to make their move. With the adrenaline pumping, the first instinct might be to run, but to act hastily now could cost them dearly later. Your mind is buzzing at this stage. You have to take out four enemy. I'm going to search the bodies quickly. They set about covering their tracks and make a run for it. But before they go, Pete strips down the enemy weapons. You know, leave the bodies of the weapon in one position, and then take the working parts and dump them further along the trail to prevent them falling back into enemy hands. As soon as he can, Eddie radios the helicopter to warn them that they've got a hot LS, a landing site that's come under enemy fire. Hotel one, hotel one, Charlie, one nine, abort, abort, abort. I've also informed them that we're moving to the secondary rendezvous point. Making for secondary RV. Over. All SAS soldiers always have a backup plan. Before you go on any mission, you will formulate an escape and evasion plan. The most important elements of these are your rendezvous points or pick-up points. These will be pre-designated areas where you'll be picked up by heli or you'll meet an agent contact to help you get out of the country. Ashby knows exactly what it feels like to face an enemy who torture and murder their prisoners. Fear. Literally the sort of fear that makes your bowels twitch. When the UN compound he had been posted to was surrounded by rebels, Ashby and three other Western officers decided to escape. The nearest safe haven was three days forced march away through tropical jungle. They were unarmed. We didn't feel that we were masters of our own destiny. And even if by doing something positive that was going to lead us to perhaps our death, then it felt better to be doing something positive than just simply to be sitting around waiting for the, for the end to happen. On the fifth day of the siege, under cover of dark, they scaled the compound walls, made their way through rebel cordons and headed out into the bush. Although it was very tempting to go th towards where the villages were, or through fields or under paths, we knew that if we did that, we were likely to bump into the locals. Bizarrely, what we had to do was always look for the thickest bit of jungle and go through that. And I found the, the, the best technique was just to rip through the foliage with my hands. And I had this feeling that every step I took was one step away from the worst of the danger. And so that was enough to keep me going. As part of the peacekeeping mission, Ashby carried little in the way of combat gear. However, as a Royal Marine trained in escape and evasion, he knew they'd need some kit. OK, so some of the gear we had with us at the time, the litre water bottle each, this particular one was quite useful because you could see the creepy crawlies. A shortwave radio, I'd actually tuned it to some of the military frequencies. As well as hiding small amounts of money in the wallet, the real money that I had with me with a piece of string attached to pull out when I needed to, with a thousand dollars in. I'm sure with a bit of imagination you can work out exactly where that was hidden. The SAS, however, prefer to come a bit more tooled up. Whether you're in country, behind enemy lines for months, or on the run for six hours, a survival kit is vital. Every member of the regiment personalises their own, and each item in it is selected by the soldier himself. This is my survival kit. Various cutting implements. A wire saw. This will cut through metal. It could also be used for other things as well. The most important thing is a good sharp 
knife, water purification tablets, a heliograph for signaling helicopters or aircraft, a pair of tweezers for removing thorns, you leave them in too long, then you're likely to turn poisonous. You may carry some local currency, some safety pins, a little sewing set, when you're on the run for a while, then your clothes start to deteriorate. A button compass, very important. A silk sketch map. This will be hidden in your body somewhere. If you go on the run, then you've got a map of the area. But a soldier's most vital survival tool is his brain. He's got to think on his feet, especially if he's bumped or has contact with the enemy. If you've been bumped by the enemy, you may want to throw in a deception plan, go in the opposite direction from what the enemy expects, try and hide your trail. But, in general, if you don't get bumped, you'll head directly to your secondary RV position. A switched-on soldier will have made a note of the surrounding countryside, navigational landmarks, rivers, and places to avoid like towns and farms. This is known as the mental map. Whatever an SAS trooper has gleaned about the locality, he is aware that the enemy will know more. At the scene of their attempted capture, the hunter force has finally arrived to witness the aftermath. It consists of expert trackers and guards. Four sentries are on point duty to the rear and the front so the trackers can get on with the job without fear of being attacked. They're looking for signs that indicate number, direction and speed of evaders. They're in your territory. They've got no transport. They're on foot. John McAleese is a trained tracker. He understands the mindset of a hunter force. A hunter force can jump ahead and just pick at the high ground. You've got time in your hands. You can sit down and think ahead. Try and think like them. What would you do? They're carrying full kit and the weapon. Realistically, they're only going to be doing maybe four or five k an hour initially, and then they're going to go down to maybe, it might even be one kilometre an hour, depending on the terrain and also depending on their physical state. Plus, they are trying to avoid leaving sign, and they're also not sort of going in the basic straight line, yeah, which is giving away their direction to travel. There are any number of high-tech systems that can help the tracker but there are some basic signs to look out for. Top signs, disturbed or broken branches that indicate direction. Middle signs, again branches, but also things like splashes on dry rock. Bottom signs, footprint, bruised or broken undergrowth, discarded items. All these can indicate number, direction and even time. But what do the SAS use to find their way when they're on the run? In a survival situation, if you intend to move your position, then you have to know what direction to go. If you have no compass, then you can use the natural environment to assist you with this. This tree is tilting towards the south. Obviously in this northern hemisphere, most sunlight is on the south side, so the foliage and the tree will lean towards the southern side. It gives you a rough idea of where south is. Moss is another general indicator of direction. In the northern hemisphere, once again, there will be more moss and it will grow thicker on the southern side of the tree. You have to look around you at all the trees in the area. And if most of the foliage and the moss is growing on the one side or leaning towards the one side, then that will give you a rough indicator of what direction south is in the northern hemisphere. Wind direction is another good indicator. Trees in exposed areas lean away from the prevailing wind. In northern Europe, this comes from the southwest, meaning the trees point northeast. Another method of finding your direction is by using the sun. You need a stick, which is approximately a meter long. Stick it in the ground vertically so that he's casting a shadow. Where the end of the shadow falls, place a stone. As the sun moves around from east to west in the sky, the shadow will move. The 
say I would do it in the morning and then come back in the afternoon and recheck where the shadow was falling. Once you've located that, place another stone at the tip of the shadow. That now gives you an east-west line. And if you stand directly behind your stick, looking at the stones, you're facing north. And north, south, east and west. On the move, a simple analogue watch can help find north. By pointing the hour hand at the sun, drawing a line between it and the 12, you have north. From that again, you can work out where west and east are. After two days under the tropical sun of Sierra Leone, on the run from rebels, Phil Ashby had a new killer to contend with. All I remember is we were all in and out of consciousness and we were, to put it mildly, as thirsty as I think it's possible to be. While dehydration took a physical toll, fatigue played tricks on his mind. On one occasion, I was convinced there was a fifth member in our party, um, but strangely it was a woman uh, dressed in a, basically a, a big white, big white um, sort of shawl. And I could see this person very clearly, and I kept on saying, look, can nobody else see this person who's standing by us? The average person can survive almost two weeks without food, but even in a mild climate, they won't last long without water. A body only has to lose 15% of its fluid before it starts to give up. The stages of dehydration begin with the obvious. But thirst soon leads to a loss of appetite. As you stew in your own juice, you lose the ability to think or even walk straight. Eventually, there's collapse and death. In a desperate gamble, Ashby's team drank the one liter of water they each had and pushed on to the nearest river. But when they got there, the river was dry. I remember hearing the noise of frogs croaking, and it occurred to me that where there were frogs, there surely had to be water. We found some muddy pools, the sort of water that at the end of the dry season, even the local animals weren't drinking. We used five times the normal dose of water purification tablets and started drinking. When picking a place to get your water, you've got to be very careful of what you're doing. There is places you must avoid at all times. Areas of habitation. Obviously, there's people living upstream then they may be using the river as a sewerage disposal area. Coniferous woods, any water running through coniferous woods may be contaminated with chemicals which is used on the trees. Cultivated areas, obviously once again water in the cultivated areas may be polluted with chemicals which is used on the land. Stagnant areas, and there's no wildlife around, no greenery, no animal life in the water, then there's a good chance that the water is poisonous. What you're looking for is a nice fast moving stream. Nice clean water. Good to drink. As well as being a good source of drinking water, a river is a good landmark to navigate by and it will cover your scent if the enemy have tracker dogs. In a typical evasion, Eddie and Pete would try to move at night and rest up during the day. As first light approaches, they'll be thinking about finding somewhere to lie up and maybe getting something to eat. With a little careful preparation, nature provides a veritable buffet of edible plants. Being on the run isn't a lifestyle choice, and frankly, you don't have the time. A lying up spot will be chosen based on how much cover it provides. Food is scavenged from bins or stolen from farms. Be careful to take crops only from the edge of the field, not leaving too many traces. Waste of all kind is buried. 
We were too thirsty to worry too much about food. But once we had managed to find some water, then what little food we did have, well, it was a godsend. I just had my 30th birthday, and more as a joke than anything else, but my wife had sent me out a small can of baked beans. And although a miniature can of baked beans doesn't uh, go particularly far between four, it may have been more a psychological effect than a physiological effect, but certainly some of the nicest food I've ever eaten were those baked beans. Any society creates a lot of waste, particularly in a war zone. On the run, picking up what looks like someone else's rubbish could just save your life. You must always look for items lying around which you might find is useful to help you to survive. Polythene bags, string, kindling. Put it inside the polythene bags to keep it dry. I now use my polythene bag to collect water. A rainy day, spread out the polythene, try and get as much surface area as possible out, and you'll collect plenty of water into it. Obviously you've got to have it in a little hollow, so that the water will run into the bag and not run out the side. Even in the survival kit, there are some unusual lifesavers. Condoms. For water collection, put it inside a sock, fill the condom with water, and get a nice little carrier bag to carry the water in. Covering up until nightfall, Eddie can only expect a few hours sleep. Especially with the enemy hunter force breathing down his neck. The SAS are trained in wilderness survival, but it's unlikely they'll need many of those skills on the run. Building a fire would simply attract attention. If it's possible, however, you might chance it if you really needed to keep warm. But in a scenario like this, Eddie wouldn't have time to rub two sticks together. In my survival kit, I carry various items to help me start the fire. A tampon. Very important that you open the tampon out. Striker and flint. Some alcohol wipes. Can be used for cleaning rooms, but can also be used for lighting fires. Some glycerin, which you mix with potassium permanganate. Potassium permanganate can also be used to sterilize your water. It tastes pretty bad, but keeps you alive. As you can see, you get a very violent reaction when these two chemicals are mixed together. This should be used only in a survival situation and at no other time. So far, Eddie and Pete have been careful to cover their tracks, but they've had a change of tactics. We have discovered we have been followed by a professional tracking unit of five or six men. What I'm going to do now is lay a track to lure them into an ambush. In a classic example of thinking on his feet, Eddie is using the tracker's skills against them. He's leaving clues and objects that he knows will get their attention, like a magazine from his gun. Then he doubles back on himself, looping the track so they're looking back on the position where he left the magazine. This will bring the enemy into our killing zone. Right to plan. The enemy hunter force have picked up Eddie's trail. He's taking a gamble that they'll concentrate on the track ahead and not see Eddie and Pete in the thin cover. If the enemy spot them first, they're dead meat.
having up to check the bodies to make sure they're all dead. You cannot afford to leave anyone left alive when they're on your track. As I got there, one of them was playing possum. I had no option to be taken out. Now you've had the opportunity to take out the lead tracking units. You've got to get as much distance between you and the rest of the hunter force as quickly as possible. Let's go. But it's still several days forced march to the final rendezvous. And even when they get there, they might have to lie low for days in poor conditions before they're picked up. The final RV, chosen because it's nothing out of the ordinary. In this case, a lay-by near a beach. We will go to that location at the same time every day until the agent turns up. The agent will identify themselves by giving us a signal. For instance, you will have a piece of music which is known to us playing in the car radio. From here, they're taken to a safe house where they can rest up for several days and the agent can arrange transport out of the country. But it would be a mistake to think they could make themselves comfortable. At this stage, you're probably at your most vulnerable. You've left your main weapons behind. You're in civilian clothes. You're only carrying sidearms. It's been over five weeks since they began the mission. In that time, they've endured hardship in the field, they've lost comrades, and for the past week, lived by their wits whilst being hunted. Phil Ashby was awarded the Queen's Gallantry Medal for his escape in Sierra Leone but he puts their survival down to something other than bravery. Determination. We got to the stage where it would have just been very easy to have given up. We'd gone through the pain barrier. It would have been very easy just to give up and die. And if it wasn't for that determination and drive, I think we probably would have done. Everybody's got an inbuilt uh, survival mode built into your body, you know, and there's some got a stronger one than others. You know, it's, it's up here. They want to live, they want to get away, and they do it. The training is a great asset, but the best thing you've got is what's between your ears. If you don't use that, then you'll end up captured or dead. In the next episode of SAS Survival Secrets, a new mission. They're out of uniform, but still tooled up. The team have been tasked with bodyguarding a British minister on a state visit. We'll take you through the drills, the language, and the hardware of a close protection unit, on foot and in vehicles. When they have to hand over security to local law enforcement, and the minister is kidnapped, they return in full-on counter-terrorist mode. Speed, aggression, surprise and firepower make for a successful rescue. Bodyguarding, counter-terrorism and how to survive as a hostage. The next mission for the team on SAS Survival Secrets.